All right, I'd like to call to order June 26, 2018, Bristol Virginia City Council meeting. Uh, at this moment, let's take a moment of silence, please. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Right, just uh, start out the meeting tonight glad to see everybody here we had a little get together for uh, mr. Hubbard so um, want to say a few things about um, Archie he gets a he gets some grief in certain corners of the city but um, a couple things seriously that Archie did for the city and he did it for the right reason and it was important one was um, you know he was the one that set up a discipline to build up the reserve fund for the city uh, increased the taxes which was unpopular but the city had pretty much little to no money in the reserve fund it was hurting our credit rating so archie was the one that proposed that stood behind it pushed it i think that was important i know when we got in front of the credit agencies they recognized that was an important thing that the city had done to build up its cash reserves and so that allowed us to get off the tans that allowed us to not have to borrow <coughs> short-term money so you know that one act alone uh, probably saved the city probably a four or five hundred thousand dollars you know over a few years so of, of interest rates um, Archie was one that would stay in here and whether you liked it or not he told you like it was um, sometimes you agreed with him sometimes you disagreed but at least he was outspoken so I think that's I think that's healthy I mean I think that's healthy for a community to you know say what you need to say at the right time to make sure everybody understands where you are uh, so I appreciate that Archie um, Thank you. So, any other comments from council on Archie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I had a few jokes. And I didn't think they well, were the right. They're not. <laughs> this is not the appropriate forum, Mr. Mayor, for those kind of jokes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you email Archie, I'll tell you one thing: you'll you'll get a response. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's a privilege for me. And uh, you know, on my behalf of my father, also, and I told you this earlier. He, you, and he have served on boards for a number of years, and. Uh, the joke between my father and Mr. Hubbard was who would be in first in line to buffet line. And, uh, but if my father were at the buffet tonight, he probably would say, you go ahead, I'll pass. Um, but uh, with all respect, um, you know, Archie, you've done a hell of a job and uh, you and I have had our disagreements here. And I think that's good for discourse between people. Uh, there's one thing for sure, he's lived in Bristol. His family's been here hundreds of years, uh, well, hundred at least and um, his whole family has served this city well um, he's a conservative <laughs> he is a fair-minded individual he's smart he didn't spend money that he doesn't have nor do the people have unwisely and i don't think i can say much more than that other than i'll, I'll take i'll say two things i'm not going to stay here as much as i love you and i mean that from the bottom of my heart you know that um, I'm not going to stay here for a presentation of People's Inc. I don't know how you can do it, but I'm not going to stay here for a presentation from an organization like that, so I'm going to get up and leave. The mayor said I could, and I'm going to. Um, but one thing, I think you're going to be giving a presentation tonight, Mr. Hubbard. And in that presentation, the one thing that you have to do, and I talked to your brother, I met your brother, very articulate, nice man, and I've known your sister before, um, good people. But the one thing, whatever you get from this council tonight, your brothers, you have to spend it at the Red Hen in Lexington, Virginia. And, um, you know, um, you have to get a passport because anytime you go north of Roanoke, you're in foreign country, as you well know. <laughs> so you have to take two Republicans that disguise themselves as Republicans, they're really Democrats, and or, uh, and two Democrats. Uh, they're easy to spot. The Republicans that are Democrats are a little bit harder. You have to kind of look beneath the surface. And they're all over the place. And they're a curse. But uh, Mr. Hubbard, you're a blessing. God love you. Long life, my friend. And uh, thanks for being a friend. Appreciate you saying the way I wrote it.
<laughs> and we'll take payments later, okay? <laughs> but I am going to ask to be excused at this time, Mr. Mayor, because I'm not going to stand here for an agenda that I can't agree with and uh, won't agree with. So, Mr. Okay. Can I be excused? <clears throat> sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Thank you, Archie. Thank you, brother. I just want to say thank you, Archie. You, uh, you've been a trooper, and you have definitely been a great asset to this community, and I want to thank you for serving this community. Uh, we need more people to step up and serve willingly, and uh, you have been a very honest man and one of the hardest workers on this council. You have put hours upon hours in, and uh, <clears throat> we just can't thank you enough. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bill, you're it. Ted, I mean, you're it. Well, uh, thank you for all you've done. I, I know you've given up a lot of naps <laughs> along the way. That's um, for sure. As uh, Councilman Fleener mentioned, you uh, do have, I'll miss the emails, especially when I'm driving home from work and my phone starts going crazy and I'm like, what in the world is Archie emailing everybody about? Uh, but more importantly, I'll miss the sense of humor that you brought to this council. Uh, you know, as we've talked about some of the decisions that have been made, a lot of the, everybody Change. knows, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> everybody knows that there's been a lot of tough decisions, but you have brought a sense of humor and levity to that. And, uh, that's very appreciative. And, uh, the one thing I will always remember to do in your honor, Archie, is to do the math. I appreciate it. <laughs> so the last couple of things, you know, Archie's the master of spreadsheets. So, yeah, he answers emails, but when you get an email back, it's a spreadsheet that's 49 rows deep, 118 <laughs> columns long. It's got 1,400 formulas in it. So you spend an hour trying to look at the formulas to make sure you understand how he's doing the math before you even look at the numbers. That's his emails. All right, so with that said, uh, City Manager, did you have to say anything about Archie? And I got a couple things I want uh, to present to him. Mr. Hubbard, uh, your service here to the, truly, um, I think, put the city in a position to save itself four years ago when you uh, did certain things that probably weren't popular at the time, but in the long run and in the grand scheme of things, uh, that decision and your leadership to get that passed, and I'm talking about the tax hikes. Um, really it put the city in a position where we can actually function now and i think the city owes you a huge debt of gratitude because we may not be having conversations at a city if it wasn't for those decisions you made four years ago uh, like mr hartley i'm going to miss your humor um, here in a few moments you're going to be presented with something and it's uh, based on <laughs> something you sent me and my Initial thought because I have a somewhat of a dry sense of humor like you uh, was to send something back and say Well, who said we were going to get you anything to begin with? <laughs> uh, but I held off on that uh, So I do wish you the best uh, Enjoy your time off. I hope to see you back in a few months on serving on some other committee or board here within the city If you feel so inclined Appreciate it very much so what I'd ask the city manager to do is for Archie's gift was to go out and try to find a four foot wide by six foot tall piggy bank since he was the guy that tried to make us set up a big piggy bank for the city well <laughs> he said we couldn't find one that big so we had to settle for a card and so I'm gonna let you <laughs> open the card and read it and then I got one other thing after you do that great big thanks for all your help oh. That's my annual signatures. <clears throat> Everybody signed it. I appreciate it very much. That was great. And then, oh, okay, good. <laughs> can always eat. A nice yeah. little gift card to Cheddar. Appreciate it very much. All right, so the last thing we got is a, is a plaque for Archie, right? So as the city manager said, you know, Archie was one that he had a saying that said, <laughs> I don't want any plaque or crystal shard when I retire. I would prefer to just quit showing up at meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so down here in the bottom right is the most important thing. Council member doling out precision, guesswork, based on unreliable data provided by people of questionable knowledge from 2014 to 2018. You will be truly missed. 
And for your information, this poster costs about one dollar to print. <laughs> dot dot dot. We think you are worth every penny. XO <laughs> XO. <laughs> Who says we don't have fun? <laughs> well, I appreciate everybody coming early and uh, <coughs> it's been a good four years and Bill's been with me all the way. I, <coughs> I may have had some ideas, but it still takes three boats to get them accomplished. So I didn't do it alone by any stretch. But <coughs> there's two different philosophies on the councils that I served. Bill and I started out four years ago we saw that we needed money. That was our first step. Everything else was kind of in second place at that time. So we got the money started. Uh, and the new council that we have now, they had great ideas as well to cut expenses by trimming the unnecessary items that are going on in the city. So that between the two councils, I think there's been a fantastic four years of work done by these people. I'm glad to have been part of it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to my naps. <laughs> so I <clears throat> appreciate all these accolades and lies that you told about me. <laughs> and we probably should have got him a different jacket. You know, this, this jacket he wears, I'm not sure what to say, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, all right, with that said, Archie, in. you know, thanks for everything, and we'll, yep. we'll miss you, buddy. We'll miss you. Appreciate it. All right, next uh, on the agenda, I don't really have any more uh, broad comments just to say we're finally through the budget cycle. So we do have a budget that's now passed for next year. So uh, city manager's on task now to execute the budget. Um, the big thing that's on the city manager's task list, let's call it, or what we've been working on, which uh, we've told a few people is, you know, we got to get uh, serious about growing the city. So, so the time of, um, of kind of cutting the toenails back and really making things heard are kind of over. You know, we got to start growing the top line revenues. So our objective uh, going forward is we've got to get a good person hired in the economic development arena. Uh, Randy's working on a very good video and package to be able to present to businesses that are interested in coming to the city. So we got to have that ready to sell the city. We want to sell the city first class, top notch. You walk in, it doesn't matter if you're from Wichita, Kansas, or you're from Honolulu, but as soon as you walk in and hand that package is handed to you and you watch that video, you're sold. We want to promote the interstate system, the rail system, the colleges that are close by, the quality of life, the educational system, you know, all the logistics infrastructure we have, our, our location, which is very central to the southeastern seaboard, you know, we got two major seaports, all those positives you don't really realize till you sit down and really look at the map and think about it. And, and so Randy's working to put together with us a, a very good packet so that we can start having some positive, serious conversations with, with companies that are ready to come to Bristol, Virginia. So we've had a couple, you know, uh, recent announcements. Uh, the fish is never in the boat till it's in the boat. You know, you always got to say, you know, wait till, wait till they're really in the boat before you you know, start patting yourself on the back, but we've had some good success this year. We've got a couple companies that are putting operations here. So next steps to build on that, right? We've got to, we got to put it in a different gear, um, really have some consistent uh, high level conversations with uh, businesses that are really wanting to come here uh, and target those types of businesses that are kind of sized for Bristol. You know, those, 25 to 50, 75 employee kind of companies that are, you know, small, but they've got manufacturing, industrial base, you know, professional type businesses that will raise the level of, uh, <coughs> of uh, salaries and, and, and prosperity for the community. So that's what we're after. Um, and so we'll hopefully do it uh, best we can next year, and then we'll just get better the following year, and uh, hopefully some good things will come out of that. You know, if you land two or three of those businesses before you know it, you know, you wake up five years later and they've doubled in size and you got a pretty solid base to, to build from. So that's what we want to do going forward. So look forward for that this coming year. And um, with that, I'll see if city manager's got any other comments. Um, I'm going to kind of follow your comments. Um, I know that we've all talked and you've read in the newspaper about what we want to do for the city of Bristol. And 
Um, I can assure everyone that we're doing everything that we can to grow our revenue now. And as the mayor said, uh, I think we've cut to where we really cannot cut anymore, and it's time to start growing, growing the revenue and changing the city in a positive manner um, with new businesses, new homes, and uh, for things for people to see and do. Um, I have a task list or a goal list from council. Uh, I've already been given part of that, and uh, so I took my assistant and a couple other people into my war room, I call it, and I came up with 20 additional goals that I've put on myself that I'm going to accomplish this year. Uh, they all won't be accomplished in the year, but we're going to start getting things in process to make significant changes here in the city uh, so that everybody can have a great place to live here in the city of Bristol. Uh, I'm not going to share those goals with council in case something goes wrong, they won't blame me. But, uh, <laughs> so, but I do have a list. Um, is Sally, yeah, Sally's here. I think Sally would like to maybe say something to council about something that has just occurred that we found out about, if she would like to inform them. So. As you all know, we finished our comprehensive plan last year. Uh, I found out today that it has it is going to be awarded the Commonwealth Plan of the Year from the Virginia American Planning Association. Wow. So that's is that because it didn't have any dust on it and we actually <laughs> had a couple things or I'm just kidding. I'm gonna get more information about why they judged it by me, but Yeah, that's that's really good because I know Honestly, there was a lot of work put into that comprehensive plan. That wasn't like a, just a little task, but we talked about it. That's got to be a living document, right? We want to yeah. we want to show the state now. We put it together and we kind of we work through that. We execute. So, right on top of my desk. yeah, good, good. Need to put it here on the wall. Post it up. So he wasn't going to read your goals, but I surely can. Can I see a show of hands? Would like to see or hear about the city manager's goals for next year. I knew I'd have one. <laughs> one is to really look at the city charter, uh, seriously look at the city charter in detail and update it uh, where we need it updated, basically centered around financial management. You know, we don't want this city ever to get in the place it got two years ago this year. We want to stay where we are moving forward, so we want to look at the charter, uh, see what we can do to refine it. Uh, maybe present a few things to uh, the state legislature to, to draft for us that would <coughs> solidify the city's financial footing, um, not let you not let you get into a situation where you borrow too much, or you're allowed to overextend yourself like we did. So um, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, we'll have a lot of discussion about how to do that, especially on the limits. What thresholds do you set? But we've got to start somewhere. So um, we know future councils can undo what we do, but the way I look at it, that's on them. Uh, our responsibility is to try to do the right thing and set the um, structure the way it should be done. And if others want to undo what what we <coughs> come up with, then you know that's their prerogative. But uh, we we've uh, we've kind of lived the fire, so we know we know how difficult uh, it was uh, trying to figure out how to get out of this. <coughs> Uh, the next one is to hire a solid economic development coordinator, which we talked about. So we want to focus on top line growth, uh, complete that presentation I talked about on a marketing plan and a video uh, is one of his goals. Uh, establish that inmate inmate work um, release program. That's that's going to be uh, a home run if, if Randy and the sheriff and the, uh, the DA and all can uh, figure this out. We've already had several meetings with some training um, organizations on how we will train these inmates and get them certified, get them skill set <laughs> certified so they're actually employable. We've got one manufacturer signed up, others looking to sign up to be able to put these inmates to work once we get them tested and get them uh, credentialed and their skill set certified. So that, uh, that by itself could save the city at least a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars, that one goal. Um, so if that's successful, that would be a really big deal for the city. Um, complete that final landfill study. So that landfill study that we asked the state for to figure out what are we going to do with our one last 
what I call, not our one last, but our last big albatross that keeps um, kicking us in the face because we're subsidizing the landfill at the tune of you know, <coughs> half a million dollars now. It was a million. We've worked it down to half a million. Uh, but we've done that at the expense of the community, having to increase the trash rates, which we don't want to have to do that. So we've got to study it and see if what we got to do to get that landfill financial burden off our plate. Uh, so that's one of the goals. And then uh, the last one is to establish some restricted funds. In other words, some accounts that are restricted for purposes that are very directional that the city needs to have the funds set aside. And one of those would be a restricted fund for city capital items, like major purchases, like fire truck, things, <coughs> things that are you know large expenses. We need to have money set aside that's restricted for those purposes only, so we don't have to worry about where that money's coming from when we need it. Another one would be a school building fund. We all were in here. We need to. This city's duty is to support the education system, but we've never had a restricted account to set up saving for the school system as time goes on. You can't wait 10, 20 years and do nothing and then think, well, now what are we going to do? So that's on there. And then the other one is debt service. They have a restricted account. So if we get cash that comes our way or whatever, and we have some extra cash, we can put it in a restricted account just to pay the debt service. So if that top line doesn't grow the way it needs to, we've got money set aside so we can pay our debt service bills and be responsible about that. So. So establishing those accounts, and that's uh, that's it. That's an easy list, right? <laughs> um, so those are, I think those are important, though. All right, with that said, any other council comments before we get in the agenda? Bill, anybody? All right. Any uh, changes uh, on the agenda at all from council? All right. All right, we'll move into uh, the first item, consider presentation by People, Inc. Mayor Mumpower, members of the council, thanks for time on your agenda this evening. I'll try not to take too much of it. I'm here to present People Incorporated's most recent annual report to you. I think you have a copy uh, at your station. This is a snapshot of uh, where People Incorporated was uh, June 30th a year ago. So um, it, it is that for that year that ended um, uh, that day almost a year ago. What you will see in here in the annual report is uh, a number of things that I think are uh, important or interesting, stories about some of the people whose lives have been changed uh, through the use of the services that we provide, uh, excerpts from our audit report. We had a clean audit report, uh, I think it's called unmodified, but uh, we had no, no findings, no question costs or anything like that for the year. You've got uh, excerpts from our financials. Uh, we had about $15 million in revenue and about the same amount in expenses uh, for the year. Uh, we had, we served over 6,000 people uh, during the course of the year. Uh, almost everything that we do is a developmental kind of service. So we provide human development, affordable housing development, small business development and community development services. Um, here in Bristol, uh, our signature project for the year, and really if you look at the back cover of the annual report, uh, signature project that we had in terms of community development project uh, for the year was the Bristol Hotel. Uh, as you. I'm sure well aware it is uh, nearing completion now. We uh, made our investment of $11.6 million of new markets tax credits into that development, covered 30% of the total development cost, and it would not have happened were it not for the injection of those uh, tax credits into the deal. Provide some very, very favorable financing uh, for that development. Uh, the Bristol Hotel, um, when it opens, will create 86 jobs uh, here in Bristol, and the majority of those will be jobs that are accessible uh, to people that don't have any uh, advanced kind of training or education. 
Uh, it'll put uh, $2.6 million a year into your local economy uh, here in Bristol. In addition to that project, uh, during the year we provided assistance to ex-offenders who are returning uh, to Bristol, helping them find jobs, helping them find housing, helping them stabilize their lives so they don't go back to prison. Uh, we provided home visiting services uh, to children to help them improve their health outcomes. Uh, we uh, worked with uh, abused and neglected children and helped them uh, obtain uh, stable housing. Uh, provided college access services, college preparation trainings, and visited visits to college campuses for potential first-generation college students, uh, working with volunteers, free income tax preparation services, uh, Head Start and Early Head Start, uh, Early Childhood Development uh, Services. We provided affordable housing, affordable rental housing, uh, weatherization to homeowners, uh, home ownership counseling to people who want to become first-time home buyers. Uh, we provided uh, assistance to people who were homeless or at risk of homelessness to keep them from becoming homeless. And we provided uh, supportive housing to people who uh, were homeless and have been chronically homeless. Uh, we provided business training to prospective entrepreneurs. We provided, uh, during the course of the year, one business loan, several uh, personal loans. Uh, we, see. we provided job training, uh, working with dislocated workers, working with adults who don't have stable uh, work histories, and working with youth who are either still in school or have recently been in school and helping them either get training or uh, obtain employment. So we had a variety of services here, here in the city during the course of the year uh, and helped people to reach their goals to uh, enhance their lives and also uh, the community. Uh, one thing uh, that I remembered as I was sitting here through the previous presentation that uh, Hotel Bristol project was first suggested uh, to us by a former city manager here, uh, <coughs> several back, but uh, we uh, love to have uh, ideas of projects and initiatives that we can undertake and uh, when you bring us ideas we uh, try and make them happen. That's an example of one uh, that did. so. Uh, Please bring us ideas about things that you'd like to see added to the list of things that we're doing here in the city. I appreciate your time. And well, thank you. And support. I will say while you're there, a lot of people don't understand this new new market tax credit uh, that he's talking about. But you know, there's a lot there's a lot of money out there in the new market tax credit pool where investors have money they're trying to put somewhere. Well, the federal government allows uh, those investors to take a tax credit if there's a project that that you can take the asset and hold it as collateral, and then you take those <coughs> monies and you apply it to that project to revitalize that building like the Bristol Hotel. And I really didn't understand that, but it's a tool for economic development where you're trying to revitalize an old dilapidated building, and the federal government requires that there be a, a nonprofit entity that's credible that can oversee that new market tax credit program. And, and it's not a little amount of money. It, it can be millions of dollars for the right project. So just overseeing a project like that is uh, <coughs> a big deal for the city. I think a lot of good things are going to come out of that, that hotel once it gets uh, open and operated. So appreciate it. And the only other thing I'd say is you heard the city managers working on the inmate uh, program to try to get these <coughs> inmates back to work. So whatever yeah. you can do to, to give some guidance and your experience to help that happen, I think the... You know, we, we've sat here and talked about this forever, you know, this social cycle of people getting in trouble, going to jail, and it never ends, and it never ends, and it's a big circle, has to stop, and so we're trying to do something different and try to see if we can break that, that chain and, and put these folks back to work and let the Sheriff's Department screen them properly and find the right job for them, and 
Um, if you can help with that, I think that would be, in my opinion, that would be very valuable for the city to have some assistance with the do's and don'ts and things that you might stumble across that we could uh, be mistake free to do that. Well, I, I'll be in touch with you, Mr. Eads, to talk about that. I wouldn't presume to give guidance, but if we can help in any way, we'll talk about it and see how we might, might help. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, appreciate your time. You. Appreciate your support. All right, next item number two on the agenda. Uh, consider a second reading and adoption of an ordinance change to the appendix of chapter 70 by chapter only. I want to start by caption only. Staff report. All right, council. Council, this is a um, the second reading of the uh, change to the collection trash collection fees within the city to a four dollar rate increase. Uh, it was part of the proposed budget on April 24th of 2018, and the fee increase would be effective on July 1, 2018. Public notice of the ordinance change was advertised in the Bristol paper on June the 7th of 2018. We don't have anyone signed up for item two, so we um, <coughs> need a council motion and a second uh, for the second reading of the ordinance. Move, <coughs> move for the second reading and adoption of an ordinance to change to the change the to, to a change to the appendix of chapter seventy by caption on. Second. Okay, got a motion, Mr. Hubbard. A second, Mr. Wingard. Any council discussion? All right, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Yes. An ordinance to repeal and reenact the appendix to Chapter 70 of the City Code. Okay. Move to adopt the ordinance. Taking a motion, Mr. Hubbard, to adopt the ordinance. Second. Second, Mr. Hartley. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Wingard? Yes. All right, item three, closed session pursuant to 2.23711.8.1 Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. Discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, discipline, and resignation of specific public officers, appointees, and employees of any public body, parentheses, personnel. I need a motion and a second to go into closed session. Make a motion that we go into executive session uh, for the reasons specified. Second. A motion, Mr. Hartley, and a second, Mr. Wingard. Hartley. Please call the roll. Yes. Hubbard. Yes. Wingard. Yes. Montauer. Yes. Uh, by roll call vote, council members certify that only business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and specified in the motion to convene the executive session were discussed. Please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Wingard? Yes. All right, on item number four, consider approval of the Oak Street Bridge. This will be a public hearing, so we'll open the public hearing. No. Um, staff report? Not a public hearing. No, no I was informed that it was. It had to be changed. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah. Well, I shouldn't have read the agenda. <laughs> My fault. Typo. <laughs> it's my first meeting. <laughs> uh, the Oak Street Bridge, the, the condition rating on it is, is rated as poor by our structural engineers who did the inspection. Uh, and, and then after observing the overall deterioration of the bridge, we felt like it was best that the bridge be closed at this time. Even even though it's 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 okay for cars, you can't take any you can't take any emergency vehicles vehicles across or big trucks or anything like that but we just felt like because of the condition it was best to close the bridge um, and and just to, to kind of give you an idea too traffic counts out there about well, at least back in 2011 or 214 trips a day each way which is pretty small in terms of traffic usage um, if you the, in the thing there's a there's a sketch that kind of shows if we close it, people that might walk to downtown, and we, we went from the corner of Highland Avenue and Park down to Blackbird Bakery, just as a, as a comparison. With the, with the bridge closed, 
it's it's a little bit longer by the distance from the Blackbird Bakery to the Country Music Museum. So just that little bit of distance is all the, the difference in in walking distance would be if somebody wanted to walk downtown from that area. Um, because of the low traffic and because it's kind of an, a, a, it, 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 it's a nuisance in terms of uh, people gathering on the bridge and kind of causing some trouble, we felt like it was best to close it. Um, and so we're, we're recommending that the bridge be closed and that we would like to, um, to close it permanently and then have the structure removed once funding is required is acquired for it. Uh, some of the residents have requested that we install a fence on both ends to close the bridge to pedestrian traffic as well until it can be removed. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those questions. Any questions about council? Yeah, I have questions. Okay. <clears throat> you say you've got residents over there wanting uh fencing put up to cut the bridge off from walking from walkers yes and the reason being I think because they've got some people that will collect on the bridge and and, and some of its drug associated and things like that is what I've, I've understood and they're just they're calling the police out there as a result of it now and so it, it, it just even before the bridge was closed and so I guess that's the reason they're wanting it kind of cut off to pedestrians as well. I think there's there several people here that want to speak to that effect as well. Is okay. there a procedure or a report you have to file with VDOT or anybody that the, when you've got a structural engineer that declares a, a roadway or a bridge that's uh, structurally uh, in a condition like that? Is there a official well, report you have to file? Currently what it is is, is the bridge rating is, is rated poor and the, and the load rating is, is, is low, which won't allow emergency vehicles or other large trucks to cross it. And so um, that rating is just there. We, after discussions with the structural engineer, we felt like it just is time to close it uh, just because of the unsafe condition. We, we feel like it's on the verge of, of, of being unsafe. It's not rated that way, but we don't want to keep pushing it until it, it, it becomes that way and, and causes a problem. So that's why we wanted to take it out of service. Do you know what year it was constructed? I think 1925, somewhere close to that. Now, now one thing I do, do need to say to the, um, this, the Virginia Department of Transportation has a, several funding programs. One of them for bridges is called State of Good Repair. And we're getting money to do the Goodson Street Bridge there's a there's some repairs that need to be done to the Martin Luther King Bridge to one side of it. They were going to give us money for this bridge, um, but I just felt like because of the low traffic, the fact that it's it's not being currently used by school uh, for school buses or even emergency vehicles can't use it, and there's been no complaints, that it just seemed like a waste of money to to rebuild the thing. And so we felt like just just removing it because of the low traffic and, and, and you can get around there without really needing to cross that bridge. If you look at that map, you can kind of get a picture of, of access to different areas and it really is not that necessary. So what you just said about the VDOT funds, uh, is that something if you didn't use them on this bridge that you could reallocate towards some other projects in the city? We wouldn't be able to necessarily reallocate it to another project because the way it's scored, they just pick the top scoring bridges and allocate it to those. This was a, this was because it was of its condition, it was scored to receive the funding. And so what I'm going to try to, if, if you guys approve this, what I'm going to try to do is see if I can take that funding, some portion of it and have the bridge removed. That's what that would, is what I'd like to try to do with some if they'll let me. Is that so? That's an eligible use, you think? I'm, I'm hoping it is. I haven't gotten a definitive answer from them. I think the railroad would probably like to have it removed themselves. Just even though it's a spur line, I think they'd like to see it gone as well. And so they 
potentially could participate in that, the cost of having it removed. Okay, we got a couple people signed up for uh, public comment. Um, got Don Snowden. Good evening. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time to listen to us. We appreciate the great job that you folks do. However, there are some things concerning the bridge that we would like to discuss here. And we also have a request here of about 97 names of people who live in this area who are requesting the bridge to be closed also because we, the traffic may be low, but we have a lot of walking people that come through there. We found there's been thieves, there's been a lot of burglaries, there's been syringes, needles found laying out in the middle of the street. And because we like to keep our neighborhood good because we have invested a lot of money in our homes in that area. And I'd like to present this uh, request yeah. to Mr. Eads. You bring it up here to pass it down to council. And here, here's the thing about it. it is not that much traffic, sure, but we are looking out for safety as far as uh, elderly. There's elderly people there that walks through animals down through there, and there's, you got people all hours of the night. I'm up, I, I, I get up a lot of times, two or three o'clock in the morning. There's people walking and cursing and just whatever, I don't know, I think they ought to be home, but they're not. But uh, we, we need for the overall safety issue here for our community, that it would also help build our property value up. And of course, if it builds our property value up, uh, you know, we're gonna get better people into our neighborhood and with this bridge closed. So we would like for you to consider to back us and to help us with this bridge, because it is unsafe. And we are asking that if you would to help us to, for the time being, it is closed. If we could put a barrier across it, because a lot of, for the foot traffic people that comes traveling through our community, they don't even live there. I mean, they don't they don't even live in the community. I've I've ran into a lot of these people, so uh, they're just roaming around. And there's been a lot of there's been there was a murder there some years ago. There's been a lot of tra uh, drugs under the bridge. Uh, officers who work the tracks and. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they have that time to really be walking the tracks and when there's other things they need to be doing. If the bridge wasn't there, then we wouldn't have, be having this issue. And we'd like for you to consider working with us and tear the bridge down to, so and to remove the bridge. Thank you. For the record, can you state your address? Oh, I'm sorry. Don Snowden, 822 Sycamore Street. Okay. Yes, thank you. Our next person that signed up... Um, for item four was uh, Clyde Long. Uh, my name is Clyde Long. Uh, I'm a resident of Bristol, Virginia. I live at 116 Solar Street. I have owned a house on uh, Solar Hill for 26 years. I live very close to Oak Street Bridge. Uh, as I understand it, the bridge was built around 1925, so it's approaching 93 years old. Um, there, was a, there was a pretty good purpose for the bridge at one time. There was a Robert E. Lee Elementary School up there. They had kids coming and going from both sides of the area. And so it was useful in that respect. The, the school has closed down and the uh, school board moved out. So the, the, the building is unused now. And, um, and so it's, it, it, it's not really a school anymore. So that purpose for the bridge is gone. Um, the, um, the other issues about the bridge I'd like to bring up is um, police, I talked to Paul Hess who lives right next to the bridge. He has lived there 30 years and he said the bridge has been a constant problem for, the, for him and for the Bristol Police Department. He can, says he cannot count the number of times the police have come to the bridge for nefarious activity on top of the bridge, under the bridge. There was a murder years ago. There was also a stabbing under the bridge, I understand. I've talked to the Bristol Police Department and there are police officers who make an, make an extra effort to walk the tracks because people live, try to live under the bridge and they deal drugs under the bridge. Uh, it's kind of a meeting point. Um, the um, Oak Street itself, if you go to Oak Street where the bridge is, uh, 
the parking is limited and there's very few driveways. Homes back then were built fairly close together, so there's not really a lot of driveways. So it, most everyone parks right on the street, and especially after work. Uh, Oak Street with, with cars on both sides, Oak Street's very narrow and it becomes basically a one lane road. And so, you know, it's not a particularly safe road for any large emergency vehicles to pass down anyway. Uh, and plus they haven't been doing so for a couple of years and I don't believe any of the departments as I understand it have ever issued any complaints that has been a problem for them. Um, so people come down at one or two o'clock in the morning, they race down Oak Street going 40, 50 miles an hour, they r race up the over the bridge and up the hill. Um, we, we have um, you know, a, a lot of activity, uh, people traveling back and forth that don't live there. The people on, on, that live on Oak Street and in the area near the bridge you know, would like, since the bridge uh, uh, is, is dilapidated, it needs to come down. Uh, the cost benefit ratio is almost nil. We would prefer to uh, have the bridge taken down and uh, permanently removed and not replaced. Um, and another reason why we want fencing at each end is because there are barriers now uh, on the bridge and uh, pedestrians or bicyclists are gonna try to push around those barriers. And there, you know, if you're on top of a bike and there's a bridge, concrete bridge railing and you go around those barriers, you, know, you could easily tip over the edge, fall down on the railroad tracks. And it's really a liability for the city of Bristol, in my opinion, the city owns the bridge and so, you know, we, we need to get people used to going downtown in, in another direction. Uh, I think for safety purposes, more than anything, you know. Right. Your time's up there. Okay. So thank but anyway, you, thank you, you all much. so much. Yep. All right. Is there anybody else want to speak on this item um, for public hearing? Yes, ma'am. So please state your name and your um, address for the record, if you don't mind. Um, Sandra Campbell, I live at 238 Oak Street, which is right there on the corner, um, right beside the bridge. Um, I've lived there for about 25 years, and so I've witnessed a lot of uh, wrong activities going on there. Um, I've witnessed drug deals, people parking in front of my house, walking up the bridge, coming right back. You know, you can kind of figure it out. Um, a lot of people walking behind the house, which is, a, it's, there's an alley down through there, which uh, is a shortcut from here to there. And so there's people there all hours of the night. Um, lots of yelling, cursing, just, you know, what have you. So it is a, it is a big safety issue for, for me as far as if, if the bridge was gone, I know it would be a lot safer. Um, you know, putting a fence up, I think, would be a wise idea it, this afternoon. Um, the bridge was a playground for about six or eight kids uh, playing on the bridge. So, you know, that's, that would be a huge safety thing to, to be concerned about until it is torn down. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, with that, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Council, uh, what's your uh, pleasure? This will be item 4.1, closure of the bridge. Uh, I move that we uh, close that bridge. Okay, Mr. Hubbard makes a motion the bridge be closed. Have a second? Yeah, I'll second that. All right, Mr. Harley makes a second. Any council discussion? <clears throat> is that this? Are you thinking? Are you going to say Well, I'm thinking, Is it yeah. closing it <clears throat> to both vehicular and pedestrian, or I mean? Yeah, that's, when we say that's where I need clarity. Close, close both. Vehicular totally and no, no pedestrian or vehicle. pedestrians. With safety issues, as far as the automobiles, I don't have a problem closing this bridge for automobiles if it's unsafe. <clears throat> and I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna have to put some thought into, more thought into closing it for pedestrians. I mean, you can't stop people from walking up and down the road and you know, society, in my opinion, you know, uh, 
we've changed. And uh, it's not uncommon for everybody, for multiple people to be going up and down the road walking, cussing, and doing whatever. And we all know that drugs is an issue in this city. But if the bridge is safe enough for pedestrians to walk across for decades, uh, I've got an issue with tearing it down because, uh, you know, they're going to have to be walking different directions to get wherever they want to, and that is a shortcut there. I've used that many times through the years, you know, on my, in my vehicles. I mean, so, but I understand the community's concerns over there. Uh, nobody wants drug activity in their neighborhoods. Nobody wants a, an unsafe structure that is being gathered. Everybody's gathering around it, you know, doing drugs, stabbing going on, killing a few years ago. I don't have a problem voting to close the school, uh, I mean, to close the uh, bridge for the vehicles. But I'm gonna have to do some, some more thinking and soul searching onto whether I, I, I feel like we need to close this to pedestrians. All right, well, I'll uh, tell you my side. I think um, if, if there's a structural engineer that's looked at it and it's a safety issue, by all means, we're responsible for the city's safety. So it has to be closed at least until more PE work can be done to see how structurally um, dilapidated the bridge is from both a vehicular and a pedestrian. In other words, a very specific uh, engineering opinion, right, on the condition um, of the bridge if it's just vehicular versus if it's just pedestrian. So if the concrete, if it is a 100-year-old bridge and the concrete's to the point where it is completely crumbling loose and now you're down into the, you know, the structure of the bridge, and I don't know for sure because I haven't, you know, put my eyeballs on it, I would say for sure we need to close it because it's a safety issue, uh, but it needs to be studied, you know, and make sure that we understand there's no doubt it should be closed for pedestrian traffic because of the condition of the bridge. Um, so I think that needs to be just looked at in more detail to make sure that is the case before, you know, before we vote on it completely, wow. it's closed for ever or it's taken down because the last thing you want to do is say, we're not going to close the pedestrian traffic and then it does come down and then somebody gets hurt. That's a, that, that's not a, that's not a logical place to be. So it's, it's better to be in a safe place, shut it down for both pedestrian and vehicular and then we study it to see what really technically should be done with that bridge, right? Uh, if they say, well, the only thing you can do is take it down because you couldn't even rebuild it safely, you know, that portion of the engineering study would tell us, uh, you know, what the answer is. So, and maybe you have that, but I think the first step is we say we close it and then we have another agenda item to, you know, get yeah, into you the can details always of that. <clears throat> reopen it for pedestrian traffic, but in the interest of safety, I think we should close it period for now and then do an in-depth to see if maybe we can reopen it to, to pedestrian traffic. I mean we all saw recently in Florida where the pedestrian bridge collapsed right um, <coughs> across the thoroughfare right that was under construction and when, and when a bridge is set there long enough it can be you know in that condition because it's set there and aged so long so you got to be really careful saying it's okay for any kind of traffic until you make sure you study the weight bearing capability of the of the structure. Um, and unfortunately, our country's got to where there's been several bridge collapses. Um, I-40 across the Mississippi River going between Arkansas and Oklahoma collapsed. Another section of the interstate up in Minnesota collapsed. It's happening. It's, it, you know, that, that, those kinds of things don't happen until statistically the infrastructure is at that point in time. So, so we are at the age of we got to be really careful with, with our bridges. I mean, the Mary Street Bridge is another one. That needs to be, you know, the... The focus of that Mary Street Bridge needs to be brought to the right attention and the heat put on the legislatures and the railroad about what are, what are you going to do because the last thing we need is that thing to collapse right across the railroad structure with those cars and we know what it we know what the condition of that bridge is and how long it is so that's just an example and this is another example so um, so I would support closing it but making sure the engineering study supports what we do next um, whether we tear it down or whatever so that's where I'm at so we got a any other discussion? well if I heard the engineer correct 
it's on the verge of being unsafe. It's not been deemed unsafe as we sit here tonight. So it is capable of foot traffic being completely safe. How long is it going to take to get a study on the bridge? Um, they, they've, they've been studying the bridge. We, we are, are doing inspections on it. At this point, the, the bridge can't, there's nothing we can do to the bridge except replace it. That's, there, there's no um, upgrading of that existing bridge. It's beyond the state of being able to be repaired. So it, it needs to be taken down and replaced or taken down and just simply re be removed. So, the, so we have to decide, I, I, I guess the decision before y'all is do you wanna, the bridge has got to come down at some point. It, at this point, I feel like it's, it's unsafe to vehicular traffic. It, we could go maybe another year, but we're gonna get into a situation where we're gonna be on the edge of how, how long we really can go. But the decision really is, do you want to get rid of the bridge permanently or do you want to replace it? Which that, <clears throat> that'll have to be determined later on. Well, I mean, you can make that, we're, we're gonna, we can't, re the bridge can't be repaired. It has to be replaced. Right. So, But it we, can't it, be torn down right now either. Not unless we get funding, separate funding to do that. Right. We, we, we do have funding to replace it. I just, personally believe that it's kind of a waste of money, a waste of taxpayer money to, to replace that bridge for something that just doesn't have a lot of traffic on it. People, it's, it's easy, if you look at that sketch, it's easy to get around without having to cross that area. You don't have to, it doesn't take but a, you know, a couple minutes extra to do what you need to do to, it, to avoid that bridge. And so again, my recommendation is to have it removed um, and, and there, I don't think a, a study is not going to tell us anything new. Well, maybe you have all the studies done. I say that because it's really the city manager's responsibility to decide whether that next step is to tear it down. So I think it's our responsibility to say it's a safety issue. We close it, and then you provide all the professional okay. engineering documentation to the city manager, and he agrees that, yes, it's been, it's been studied with licensed engineers, and they're all saying the same thing. And my, my recommendation to the city manager is we tear it down then we want an agenda item to hear from the city manager and say that's the next step. Okay. Let's tear it down and vote on it, right? So just give him the opportunity with the review and let's take that next step. That's where, that's what I think the right thing to do is. Any other discussion? Got a motion by Mr. Hubbard and a second by Mr. Hartley, so let's please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Windsor? Abstain? Yes. All right, item five, consider second public hearing regarding FY 1819 CDBG and Home Allocations Action Plan. So open the public hearing, staff, staff comment. I uh, don't really have a comment. This uh, agenda item is purely to see if we have any uh, public uh, comments. And no one signed up for item five. Anyone uh, in the audience want to comment on item five on the agenda? Okay. Close the public hearing. Because that's it on that uh, item, correct? Okay. All right, item six, consider approval of the annual action plan for the CDBG. Okay, I hope y'all can read that up. up. Um, on the screen there. Um, each year the City of Bristol is a recipient of federal funding through HUD. Um, this year's allocation totals $254,487 in CDBG funding, which is Community Development Block Grant funding, and $75,914.93 in home funds, which are administered through the Tennessee-Virginia Home Consortium. Um, each year the City develops an annual action plan that provides a blueprint to HUD as to how the city will spend its CDBG funding. All activities must be part of the city's CDBG comprehensive plan, which is established every five years and outlines the, outlines the city's goals and is submitted to HUD. This year's allocation has been distributed as follows, compliant with certain parameters set by HUD. 
And as you can see, the um, allocations are up on the, the PowerPoint. Um, we'd like to allocate um, 27,812 to sidewalk improvements, $40,720 to removal of unsafe structures, which of course is demolition, $43,435 to emergency housing rehab, uh, $12,725 to economic development activities, $40,720 to code enforcement. Um, also, $50,900 of that is, um, can go to administration. Um, that's usually up to 20% of the allocation. And then we've also allocated $38,175 to public service projects. And you can see those on to the right of the screen. How that's how the uh, uh, we made an allocation to the uh, public service projects. Um, staff has posted two public notices and held a public comment period as required with drafts of the action uh, plan made available to the public. Um, this is so the public can uh, uh, participate in the development of needs, review the proposed activities, and review past program performance. The first public hearing was held on May 22nd of this year, and the second public hearing is being held tonight. At the May 22nd regularly scheduled council meeting, the mayor's subcommittee was formed and directed to review this year's CDBG annual action plan and recommended activities. The subcommittee met on May 31st with staff to fulfill this direction. Through discussion and consensus, the committee recommends the annual action plan and associated activities as presented. Thank you. So no one has signed up for this item six. So um, with the pleasure of council. Move to approve the annual action plan for the CDBG block grants. Second. Okay, We've got a motion by Mr. Hubbard, second by Mr. Wingard. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hartley. Yes. Hubbard. Yes. Lingard. Yes. Lumpower. Yes. Thank you. All right, item seven, consider <clears throat> receiving bids on the sale of city-owned property. Staff report. Uh, council, at the last um, city council meeting, I've lost my place, hang on. <laughs> at the last city council meeting, we had uh, two bids on two separate pieces of property that individuals had requested to purchase from the city. One was located off of Randolph Street. A church has requested to purchase a parcel of property, and then another parcel of property was in Clear Creek. We opened those bids at the public hearing um, at, the June 4, at the June 12th meeting and they were the only bids received on those properties after a uh, notice uh, that any bids would be accepted up until June the 12th at 5 p.m. So with that being said, with no other bids that we received, those were the highest bids for those pieces of property. Um, with the real estate agent that we have um, come to an agreement with to help us sell some real estate, he has secured two contracts for each of those pieces of property. <coughs> and I'm requesting permission to sign those contracts and move forward with the sale of those pieces of property. Okay. All right, no one signed up for this item. Um, what's the pleasure of council? I uh, recommend that we uh, move forward with the sale of this property. Okay, and accept these Mr. offers. Wingard. I'll second. Second, Mr. Hartley. One. Any, any discussion? I have one question uh, either for Mr. Eads or Ms. Spradlin, would the, would the funds from this be counted towards this year's budget or next year's? It would be next year's budget. Closing is not scheduled to August the 15th. Okay. Okay, I think uh, this is the first two of several pieces of property that we're looking to, to sell out of the city assets to create some uh, cash that we can then put in the, the proper place for future needs of the city so um, we'll keep working on those other properties as time goes on all right any, any other comments from council all right please call the roll Hartley. yes Hubbard. yes Lingard. yes Lumpower. yes 
All right, item eight, consider support for the establishment of a trailhead parking area for the Mendota Trail staff report. Well, Mr. Pose want to do that staff report. I don't get the green light, do I? Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you for having me here. Um, I want to start this by saying earlier today I received a call and had a lengthy conversation with Ms. Marnie, and I do appreciate her counsel on this. Um, that has resulted in kind of a slightly more detailed presentation than what I'd originally planned. So uh, hopefully it won't be too different from what you had in your agenda item summary. Um, I will say that this is a time sensitive matter. Uh, one of the reasons is the grants that we're applying for has uh, only comes around every two years and it has a deadline for uh, application of the middle of July. So we're a little bit behind the, on that. I hope you all received the agenda item summary in the memo and I hope you had a chance to read that. If so, I won't have to go over that again. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Mendota Trail and um, one of the things is we've, it's, it's been stagnant for a long time and hasn't really moved forward. And I'm happy to say that with Mountain Heritage uh, at the helm now, it seems to be moving in the right direction and things are, are actually happening like they're supposed to. Uh, one major portion of Mountain Heritage financing plan relies on grants. And so um, that's why we're here discussing this today. The Rails to Trails grant provides funds to create and improve trails. Uh, it's a very, competitive grant process. There's a lot of applications. And so one of the things that they have to do is they have to provide probably the best application that they possibly can. And that's kind of where we come in. There's a lot of check boxes. There's a lot of narratives. Uh, one of the very important check boxes is uh, regional municipal cooperation. And uh, so we're uh, hopefully being able to, uh, we feel that, that that's a, a great thing that we could share in with them. Um, our goal is to use this opportunity to take our first step in the implementation of our award-winning comp plan, which I like saying, because that was really awesome. Congratulations, Sally. Uh, I'll say it again. Our award-winning comp plan specifically laid out the development. And I don't have my clicker. Oh, sorry. really laid out the development of shared use paths and green waste all throughout the city, as you can see. I know the, the text is a little hard. No, it's not a little hard, it's impossible. Impossible, sorry, yeah. <laughs> our award-winning comp plan is much better than our non-award-winning scanner. Uh, so we'll just kind of run through this pretty quick. Um, one of the things that you'll actually see is a, a trail called the Corvette Trail. We didn't come up with that name, but it's a very unique name. It's based on the fact that the very first Corvette body was built at Bob Morrison Boulevard plant from Strongwell. And so, uh, not Strongwell, but previous Bob Morrison molded fiberglass. And so they call it the Corvette Trail. It's a pretty neat little thing that uh, we don't know if we're really on board with yet. But anyway, am I going backwards, Gene? Sorry. Um, one of the things you can see is, is one of those greenways actually attaches up to where the Mendota Trail comes in. And um, as you probably know, the Mendota Trail is completely in Washington County, but we have the terminus for the southern end of that that actually butts up against the city limits. And this is a little example of what that is. Um, there's a small section you can see there in dark blue that says VDOT right of way. Uh, that's the section under the interstate you'll see the trail is in orange and that's the existing Mendota trail that comes in. Uh, you'll see a small dark section that says handicap ramp. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to achieve with this is making the trailhead ADA accessible. And you'll see the area listed as a parking area. And uh, that's one of the areas that, that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, Mountain Heritage has already talked to VDOT and they've got approval for um, use of the VDOT right-of-way. Um, they can't use, they can't park vehicles under the bridge. They can't have motorized vehicles unless they're using them for routine maintenance at times. So it's basically limited to foot traffic, bike traffic, and rascals, something like that. Um, 
One of the things you also notice on the creek is the light, uh, the, on the plan is the light blue line, and that's the creek. And that created a very big problem for them accessing the trail on the Washington County side, which is the north side of the Interstate 81. And that's because to get across the creek, they would have to have the expenditure of a, a vehicular bridge. And so the most logical place for any trailhead here would be the seat of the area that you see marked parking area. Uh, they have spoken with uh, the owner of the property and they have gotten a verbal agreement on a cost for that. So they're moving forward there. This next slide kind of shows you the relationship between the parking area and actually the trailhead. You'll see the green arrow shows you where the trail comes under the interstate. And you can see it's pretty well manicured, it's, it's flat, it's graveled, and it's, uh, it's pretty nice. Um, the yellow line shows you where this parking area would be. One of the things that we have to do is get from the yellow line to the green line and make it ADA accessible. This shows you the other end of the property, which shows you the ingress egress. Now, the good thing about this is it's actually on Island Road, which isn't as heavily traveled as the Pittstown section on the other end. So this gives you a little easier traffic getting in and out of the place. This is a slide that shows you the layout and the topography of the land, and you can see that the parking area can be made here without a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of excavation. It's pretty flat, the entrance is already done, so there's a lot of stuff we're really ahead on. This is an example of what we consider a parking area. Um, we don't want it just to be too grand. You know, we want gravel, packed gravel, uh, easy to maintain, easy in and out. This is an example of what we would want if we wanted a, a bath house facility there. Something simple, it's nothing too elaborate. We're trying to keep the cost down on this as much as we can. So, during our staff discussions with Mountain Heritage, we were very clear on the fact that um, the city would not have any monies involved in this, in this cooperation. And they were in complete agreement with that. They've got some monies uh, set aside through donations and the rest of the money is from grants. The city's involvement would be in-kind services only, such as engineering services, and uh, that would be used for, with Mountain Heritage for their grant application as, as a grant match. The grant that they're looking for is, uh, could possibly be $500,000. Um, but as we said before, this is a very competitive grant. Uh, they may not get the entire portion, they may get a, a small portion of that. Uh, there are several other municipalities, uh, regional areas and agencies that are cooperating with this. And I've actually got a letter here that if Amy doesn't mind, I will get her to give you these. I should have done it earlier, I'm sorry. This is kind of what we're looking for. If you'll take a look at this letter, what we're actually asking for. Staff realizes that the city's already put a lot of money into this already. Uh, over the years, the city has been very involved in this project as far as you know, purchasing property. And at one time, the city owned property as far out as downtown Mendota. So um, we feel that this is finally our chance to get a small bit of return on our investment from the city. Um, existing local businesses have seen the positive financial impact that the Creeper Trail has had. and um, I think that our businesses are, are really looking forward to having something similar here. And we may even have some people here who uh, want to speak about that tonight. So our staff recommendation is a similar letter of support from what you have uh, for Mountain Heritage Rails to Trails grant application and uh, cooperation in the establishing of a trailhead parking area. And we are calling it a parking area, not a park and that would be at the Bristol terminus of the Mendota Trail. Any other questions? Do they have plans to charge any parking fees or anything like that? No charge, there will be, that's one of the other things that the trail, that was a checkbox actually on the application was whether the trail is completely open to the public or if there will be any permits required. So um, let me understand this then, Mountain Heritage would own the parking area? Mountain Heritage would own the parking area and it would be up to them for, for the maintenance. They would maintain both the parking area and the restrooms? Restrooms, parking area. They're, they've worked out a deal or they're in process of working out a deal with BBU for hopefully reduced rates on water and electric. Okay. 
So how many other uh, parking areas or entrance points are planned along the, the trail route? There, there actually is going to be only at this point two parking areas. There's one already established in Mendota, which there's already about a mile of the trail, that, which is accessible in Mendota that you can actually go to and walk. Um, we actually have a video. It's about five minutes long if you want to watch it. If is that you don't, parking area finished? It, that parking area is, is ready to be done. I don't think it has restroom facilities, but it is just a parking area. And, and that's what we can do to start here, actually. And how was that funded, that parking area? Who, who was behind that? Uh, that was because of the way that it was laid out. It was a depot area in Mendota, so it was a lot larger parcel of land. It wasn't just a trail. So there was a large graded area that was graveled, um, and it had been for, for many years. So it was easy for it. You Basically, it was ready for when they bought the property. What's the estimated cost of, of doing this? Estimated cost for acquiring the property, we think now is around $60,000. Um, we think that the bathroom could possibly be close to 20 for materials, which they'll all, you know, all this is expensive then. Um, and grade work, depending on how extensive you want to go, uh, then it depends on the cost of, of rock at the time and how big we want it, if we want to start small and then do it in phases. So probably another $20,000. Now, if they get more of the grant, one of the good things is another checkbox on the grant application is for them to make a portion of the trail ADA accessible. So what they'll actually do is use a portion of that money to actually make sure that they can get ADA accessibility out through the trail. We spoke today with um, a grant consultant, and um, one of the things they said was that they really like to see it go somewhere, not just we have not just say we have a mile of ADA accessible trail. It needs to go somewhere like a, an overlook or a, a beautiful scenery at a creek with a turn, you know, somewhere that they can turn around and actually go to. So the money can be used. We don't think that all the money for the grant will be used specifically for this. It will extend off into the trail. So if you got on the trail right there into the interstate and started walking that way, parallel on Benham's Road, where, it, where, where, would, it, where would you stop walking where it's not finished? Uh, with the condition it is now, there's two there's two really spots that are kind of rough. The first spot is where they, and you probably really remember where this was, the campground road trestle that they removed. When they removed that trestle, it made it a little more difficult because now, and they've got a, an agreement with VDOT to go in, and there's a little bit more grade work that needs to be done to smooth that out to make it so that you're not on the road as much, which now what you end up doing is you end up walking down and then you walk about a half a mile on campground road, which really isn't what you want to do when you're on a trail. So they're in talks to, to kind of upgrade that. So that's about as far as you can go without some major improvements if you just started walking now. So um, what grant are you going to apply for? It's the Rails to Trails program. And what we're doing is we're actually applying for two sections. One of it, the first section is for planning, and the second section is for implementation and construction. And are we just the sponsor of the grant? We're just, we're just not as much a, a fiscal sponsor as we're just in a cooperation with them. So what if, um, devil's advocate, what if something, you know, falls apart with the Heritage Foundation and the trail that get finished and the grant doesn't get terms and conditions don't get obligated. What's the fallback? Nothing. At this point, it, you won't. They won't get the money until it's been. It's a reimbursement. Or, uh, so they spend. They get reimbursed. As yeah. The, yeah. Okay. As the money spent, they get reimbursed. Are Are they the actual applicant or are we the actual applicant? It's almost a co-application. We're We're listed as cooperating with them. Now we can we can find out more about that specifically how they they no, list us. Fine. But so is Washington County signed uh, for uh, for any grants? Washington County is participating with them, and they've we've actually tried to get uh, their letter of, of support also along with this. Um, we just didn't get it in time. Um, but what but the, well financially, what have they done, Washington County, to do this something similar to the parking to make the rest of the trail? That's workable. a question we'll have to ask. The gentleman from Mount Harris. I don't know exactly what Washington County's financial commitment is at this time. Um, the biggest problem that we have is just because even if we if we made the trail 
to where it was functional, there's nowhere to park. There's no way to, you know, you can't park and, and then get on the trail on this end. You're just kind of stuck. We have a nice trail, but nowhere to, no way to access it. But then if you put the parking thing in first, then you have no place to go. Yeah, I have no place. But one of the things that they say is, believe it or not, the, the Mendota side has about a mile that's easily accessible. From the conversations that we've had with the gentleman at Mountain Heritage, we can probably get on our end a pretty easy three to five miles. Now, the total trail is about 12 and a half to 14. Um, and so we could stand to get a pretty substantial chunk on our end that is walkable and rideable. Uh, probably not ADA accessible, but definitely walkable and rideable. So regardless of what happens, whether they get the grant or they don't, it's engineering services is basically our obligation. In kind service. In kind services. I spoke to Wallace about this a little a little earlier and and we were one of the things we were concerned about is whether or not we could actually use public works employees on private property. And uh, we have looked into it, and it is, it's allowable for what, what the scope of this work would be. And you have a uh, clause that it's got some not to exceed conditions in there so that it's you know, in-kind services, but there's a limit to the in-kind services. It's not like it's an, an endless open checkbook forever kind of thing. We don't, but we can. That's a good idea. Um, we think that the small portion of what we do to get it's a parking lot you know there's there's about only so so far you can go with it you can't make more than four or five years out of this can you well i would just say <laughs> so not. i mean in kind services though you know people i'm not saying they would but you got to say could we be estimate abused. that the engineering hours here to do this would be about x so we're going to put a cap on how many yeah. hours we actually apply to this and one of the things that we're here tonight is, is not just to get the end all be all of approval for everything but just the uh, whether or not that the council is wants to move forward with this and wants to be in a, a a cooperation with mountain heritage to do something like this what's the timeline on the grant how quick a turnaround is it well we we got good news and bad news about that today um We'll, we have to have the grant application completed and turned in by the 15th. Um, they said that the reimbursement, once if, if we're approved, that the reimbursement could take anywhere from 45 days to a year and a half. I'm, I'm talking how, how long will it take before you find out if it's awarded? Oh, whether or not the award. Yeah. yeah. That I do not know. September. September. Quite that, uh, that appears to be quite a bit of land. What kind of land mass are we talking about? Two and a half acres. Two and a half acres that right now sits on the tax roll at about $18,000, and uh, tax taxable revenue for that is uh, right at $180 or $200 annually. <clears throat> okay, and uh, property owner's maintaining it right now, mowing it. That is and, correct. And uh, this... <clears throat> this outfit doing the trail once it's purchased. I mean, uh, I can't ever see them having that many vehicles parked up there. So it is a big it's lot. gonna be I mean, an added expense to them on their operational side just to maintain that amount of property, keeping it mowed. I agree. Um, is, there a why, is there a reason why they're going after so much land right there? It's the only portion that the owner will sell. It's an all or nothing. I'm sure that they would probably prefer to have, you know, three quarters of an acre or an acre. But at this point, the it's the only game in town, and I think the property owner realizes that. I mean, there's we've we've actually staff wise, we've looked at other options to see if there was some other way to get access to that trail. And at this point, like I said, I hate to say, it, but that's the only game in town. Where the, <clears throat> have you talked to the business owners that are? you know, kind of right there underneath the interstate in close proximity to that parking lot? We haven't talked to the ones in Washington County. Um, one of the other, um, the owner, which is across the street, Precision Auto, was actually wanting this property for a while, but he was never, and he wanted to use it to park vehicles on. Um, Taff and Fry was also interested in the property to park vehicles on. Basically, everybody that's interested in it wants to use it for parking area from what's around there close by. Um, but the price was a little higher than what they wanted to pay. And the owner, you know, wants to sell it all in one piece. He doesn't want to subdivide. And um, 
That could I be something that the owner could use as to rent part of it until the thing gets yeah. so big that he has to move them off, but he can get some money. Well, that would help pay the maintenance. I mean, I was thinking kind of like they do in Damascus. If, the, if this trail takes off, you could set up a bike rental shop or something. I mean, they could rent part of it out and let somebody put a business there if they had enough space. Uh, I could see, I could see uses for the the rest of it that would help them. And it's their money if they've got they they maintain it. That's all we're really after is maintaining it so it doesn't have a bunch of weeds out in the front. One of the odd things too is if you'll notice the bank, and get a better picture here. Uh, you see the the erosion that's on that bank. That's actually ours. <laughs> that's city right of way, and so we maintain almost up to the top of that bank at this point anyway. And I think Public Works has had a little bit of a headache trying to control the erosion and sediment control off of that bank. So, you know, we may be able to once we put that because uh, the trail will uh, the um, handicap accessible part of it will have to go down that that face to meet ADA requirements and so we may kill two birds with one stone with being able to control the ENS problems a little bit better and there's gentlemen here from Mountain Heritage and other places if you would like to ask them specific questions that I can't answer okay we might we get to sit council discussion we'll sure. get to that point any other questions okay. for Mr. Powell? okay all right, public comment. We've got one person signed up, Nancy Marnie. Mr. Mayor, members of council, my name is Nancy Marney. I'm a resident of the city of Bristol, Virginia. I am a taxpayer. I was in the council chambers for every discussion that came up about the Mendota Trail. The city of Bristol, Virginia does not own one inch, not one inch of the Mendota Trail. This is not our issue. I do not think we should get into it. Look how much time you've just now spent talking about this. This isn't our issue. This is an issue between the people who bought that property and the people who own the property that they're talking about right now for a parking lot. This has nothing to do with the city of Bristol, Virginia. We've got enough trouble of our own. Now, you're already talking about service in kind, public works. We've laid people off from the public works, folks. We're already short. You're talking about our engineer going out there on property we don't even own. Now, the city of Bristol, Virginia finally, finally got out of any commitment to the Mendota Trail. It was an absolute nightmare. I think I'm correct and I will have an answer from our chief financial officer. Uh, I think we spent over a million dollars surveying and looking at things we didn't even own. The city was being expected to maintain, provide police protection, provide emergency services, take up, put down the, tr the trestles for the railroad. That's what we were expected to do when this first came up. Washington County made it abundantly clear from the beginning they would not put one penny into that trail. They made that very clear. This is not Bristol, Virginia's issue. Let the people who own the property deal with it. It's not our issue. You've spent all this time tonight on this. Our staff being paid, we're short-handed. And they're wallowing around in something that isn't even ours, folks. If they want a municipality to support them, call Washington County. This is not Bristol, Virginia's issue. Leave it alone, stay out of it, fellas. 
we got into an enormously bad situation and we finally got out of it. It will not end here. I will guarantee you that. This will only be the beginning until we are tapped and tapped and tapped down the line. The devil is in the detail, remember? Thank you, Ms. Morning. All right, what's the pleasure of council? Well, I'll say it sounds like there's not any uh, quick agreement on anything that this needs to be uh, tabled or a motion made to uh, either table it for further discussion or not support it. When, when does this happen? 15th of July. That gives you enough time. Is there? Did you say the county wasn't going to support it because it didn't have time to, to get it into you? Or, I mean, what's the deal? No, the county the county is, is supporting this, but the thing is to purchase the property inside the city doesn't do the county very much good. This is city property, not county property. Well, it's not city property. It's owned by Well, that's true. It's division. in the city. I'm, I'm saying the city and doesn't own it, but The city but it doesn't is. own it. The city would have um, in-kind services in exchange for the grant application. Um, we wouldn't own it after the fact. We would have no responsibility to it after the fact. It would solely be owned by Mountain Heritage, and or, um, it's no different than anyone coming in buying any other piece of property in the city. We have no liability to it once it's purchased by someone else, and we have no liability now except for what's in there right away. And the expenses are not going to occur unless they win the award. That's correct. So, and we're not the physical agent for that's this. That's correct. No. Well. So, based on some public comment we heard, why is it we need to get involved at all then? It's well, required I, by the it, grant. As part of the grant process, they like a locality involved for cooperation. It's one of the check boxes that the grants look at when they're going over each lo each grant application that's been uh, submitted, whether or not the locality is willing to have um, some Support. sort of skin in the game, at least in the process of getting the grant and seeing it to fruition. So is there like zoning issues or permit issues? Why would we? I mean, as far as the city goes, there's, uh, there's no issues in regards to zoning. There shouldn't be any issues of <coughs> permitting. It's basically you're turning a flat piece of property into a parking lot with gravel. And they're, they're also going to be using our in-kind services for the grant. And, you know, I would like to remind council that if you go to Damascus on any given day or even the trailhead in Abingdon or the Creeper Trail, you know, it took time for the creeper trail to catch on, but over time, the creeper trail has been an economic boom for Damascus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know if there's any way to gauge what type of boom it would be for the city of Bristol at this point, but I would anticipate individuals who park their vehicle there, go ride on the trail uh, on a Saturday, would come back to their vehicle and want to go eat, and they just so happen to be in the city of Bristol and. There's plenty of restaurants that they can go to within the city of Bristol, and uh, that's tax revenue for the city. But that is the same Shh. No, 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 no. Miss. We heard your comments. What you said was valid. So I, I'm, I see both sides of this. You know, I, I understand um, both sides of it. This was a very, very controversial issue out in Washington County. Half were for it and half completely hated it. Saw, heard, heard both sides of it. I mean, it got emotional, right? So, so this is not this is not an easy discussion because of all that. So, and you know, it is. I mean, it is 99.99 percent in Washington County. There's very little of this in the city of Bristol, Virginia. But it's also valid that people who will come and use the trail, 
you know, that put, park their cars will go out and get gas and do things. So that is a true statement. That will happen, right? But to me, I'm sitting there thinking it's a little bit, I don't know, it's a cart before the horse a little bit or something. I, it's like put the parking lot in first before the, you know, the foundations really completed the trail and made it accessible. Well, the trail, I just the, don't. the problem that, that they're having right now is the accessibility to the trail. The trail's there. The trail's accessible. You can get on it right now and walk. The problem is there's nowhere to park. You can't park a vehicle there. The closest place to park would be So why can't the foundation, why can't they do their own engineering and get out there and grade it? I mean, there's contracts that come in and just uh, get a permit and grade it out and lay it out in probably a couple weeks. Well, this goes back to the grant application, okay. whether or not the locality That is. hurts the grant application. Right. The locality has to be in there with some either in kind or cash, in this case in kind, in order to qualify for the grant. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. So and we don't spend anything if they don't get the grant. So uh, Washington County could be the supporter of the grant, right? They could That's have the not, in kind. But the problem is it. they're not in. The property is in yeah. the city limits. Well, we we passed this resolution in Washington County Chambers, right? You remember that that said we were going to partner up and we were going to work together on joint projects. So how about we put this out there and say. Well, let's use this one to see how we cooperate because there's been nothing that's come out of that discussion. And, you know, we, we either need to work together or say we're not going to work together, you know, one or the other. Um, so I'm not really for it or against it. I just see both sides of it. And I, I, I think Washington County has got to step up. They, they need to take the leadership role because Would you, the fact is most of it's in the county. There's, I didn't you, understand why the city even had any of the, any of the, you know, rail bed going back through there anyway. That didn't even make any sense, right? But it was a long did. time ago. So, would you want to hear from the owner to see sure, if he's in contact sure. with Washington County? Because I don't know and I can't speak to that. You know, and he may be able That's to fine. shine some more light on that cooperation. My name's Frank Kilgore. I represent Mountain Heritage. Uh, two years ago, the city of Bristol donated. Fee simple title to this 12 and a half miles upon the understanding that we would uh, work vigorously to get it open. We've opened the first mile, which extinguished the reversion clause that the city of Bristol put in our deed. We have, we're poised now to do the first five miles from I-81 to Benham's. We've uh, reconstructed a trestle uh, that's only several hundred yards from I-81. We've got a VDOT permit to go around the 500 foot long trestle that's torn down on Campground Road. We had a donor buy the Cook property there so that we could go on it. Uh, we have a VDOT permit. We're now getting a soil and rose control permit from County of Washington to reroute around that old torn down trestle. Uh, we've stripped the old uh, rotted ties off of two more, three more trestles on the way to Benham's. So, we're very close to having the first five miles of the Mendota Trail from Bristol to Benham's. Um, this grant would uh, allow us to access money to build the trailhead that would benefit Bristol. It's a major trailhead. When you go the five miles and 10 mile radiuses around Bristol, you have much more population that would have access to this trailhead than anywhere around Damascus or Abingdon. Um, the Washington County Board of Supervisors two months ago unanimously passed a resolution endorsing any grant funding that we pursued as long as they didn't have to put money in it. Same, same issue that we have here. Um, so Washington County is backing us unanimously as far as support. We're going to apply for other public grants uh, based upon their resolution supporting the entire trail that uh, the city of Bristol would benefit greatly from the trailhead being this convenient to the Mendota Trail first five miles. The trail total is 12.5 miles. In two years, if we finish this year, this five miles to Benham's, we will have half of the entire quarter turned over to the public use. And when you compare that to how long this project's been on the agenda here and other places, that's pretty phenomenal. And we've done it all with public donations and volunteers. I mean, excuse me, private donations and volunteers. 
uh, as private donors um, put more money in and see progress, they, they expect us to be able to access public funds. And so that's, that's where we're at. And it's, you're talking about five miles poised to be opened for the first time in anybody's lifetime for a trail from Bristol to Benham's and then from Benham's on to Mendota in the next two or three years. We got 13 trestles that we have to rehab between um, I-81 and Mendota. So we've done a lot. Well, the engineering is, we're only talking about the lot, the parking lot, not engineering for any part of the trail. That, that's correct, it'd be just the site plan for, for the parking lot, lot for the parking and lot. that's it yeah and that's pretty minimal it's a it's a real minor kind of thing for us to do okay so what's the time period to get the first five miles you're describing completed so it's actually uh, accessible for bike riders and walkers well depends on if we get this uh, grant and get the parking lot done there's no safe way to get to the trailhead now VDOT won't allow us to get on our own property to put in parking underneath the I-81 bridge. We have a 50 foot wide strip of land there, but we can't drive vehicles under there. If y'all remember last year, I believe there was some uh, a fire under an interstate bridge in Atlanta, closed down the, the interstate for weeks. And so they say no parking under the interstate, no driving under the interstate except for maintenance vehicles. So we have to be on the Bristol side of the interstate to have a trailhead. So if you get the grant um, application filed and you get issued a grant in say 15 July, then how long to finish the five miles? Uh, we need about $50,000 to finish from just on the Washington County end of the, of the um, I-81 bridge from there to Benham's about $50,000 to finish that then if we get the grant for this I would say within six months after we receive the money for this grant we will have the five miles completed and the trailhead finished so if we if we support this your your sign up for it will be accessible by January of next year January next year. Well, I'm talking about six months from when we actually get the grant awarded. Because yeah, it, I said, uh, yes, let's assume yes, you get the yes. grant awarded. Let's say, uh, I hypothetically said July 15th, but it may be different. But six months from the Early time next it year, awards, uh, right. uh, the five miles and the trailhead should be finished. Because you already have all the other funds to do the rest of the work then for the five miles. We have the permits. Uh, we've raised two hundred thousand dollars in private money. And part of that was to buy a piece of land that was essential to get around the torn out uh, campground road trestle. This took a lot of work. Uh, we had to apply to VDOT, and you know how long that process takes, to go across campground road, up the wide shoulder, and up the old campground road roadbed. We have a donor who's going to pay for that. We got the uh, contractor ready. And now we're applying for a soil and erosion control permit from uh, Washington County. They've cooperated with us on, on every level of this. Um, I promised this, the prior council and the mayor that we would notify everybody along the trail, the people who live next to the trail, about what we're doing and when we were going to do it, and we've kept that promise. We've mailed everybody a, a, a very thick packet of information. The judge is ruling that the, uh, that the uh, Trail, the railroad property did not revert to the adjoining landowners, a copy of her deed, and air offer to help them in any way if they want us to come out and look at ways, make sure they have a crossing over us. Uh, I did put in there, if you don't believe we have the legal right to uh, this property, then you need to go see an attorney and have them contact me because I was, I'm not going to debate that over the phone. We've got a judge's uh, opinion. And so far, uh, knock on wood, we've only had to notify four adjoining landowners not to block our way. That's pretty phenomenal compared to how, how I guess uh, it was 15 years ago when Bristol first started to do this. So this support, uh, it, was, it was asked about um, 
whether you'll be back for more support. So this is the only this is the only support you'll ever be in here, Council Chambers, for this uh, one request. Well, I don't I don't know that we wouldn't ask for a resolution like we are now that y'all support us getting the the grant another grant, but we're not going to ask you for any money. I promised the town count, the city council. Well, what I'm saying is, okay, let's say we support it and there's some in-kind work done. Let's say the engineer says there's 20 hours of work here to get it all laid out in CAD, whatever. We, that gets done. And then six months later, you come back. Now we want to put lights in. And then six months later, now you want to put in something, something. We don't want this continuous, you know, flood of now we want to do this, now we want to do this. So we want to hear it all right now. You know, so the public can hear it, community can hear it. You know, we understand what we're doing here. So that's why I'm asking the question. Well, I like to, not to promise something that I don't know for 100% sure that would never come back on a multi jurisdictional application where if you've got two governing bodies instead of one, you have a higher percentage of getting a grant uh, for the trail itself. I mean, Bristol, of all the places along the trail, is going to benefit more from this trail economically than Mendota ever will. So would, can I stand here today and say we'll never come back and say we've got an a opportunity to get a million dollar grant if two or more municipalities pass a resolution, put no money in, but pass a resolution supporting the project? That'd be a hard thing to promise. It'd really be counterproductive to Bristol if we could get a million dollars and move this trail all the way to Mendota because once people start using that trail and we get all the trestles finished, Bristol's going to enjoy a huge economic impact benefit from this. More per capita than the people in Ambedon and Damascus. We had a five mile and 10 mile radius study done at Bristol and there's a lot of people in a five mile and 10 mile radius of this trailhead. A lot more than there are uh, in that same radius in Abingdon and Damascus. So uh, we're doing this for free. All the work we've done the last two years have been by volunteers and, and private donors. I don't know that any, anybody's ever come here to you all with that history and that background. I, w I don't think. Right, what are the questions we got? Other than I've, I've been to Damascus many times and it's always busy. Yeah. And there's all kinds of little mom and pop stores all around the railhead or the entrance where you rent the bicycle. That town was dead before yeah. the trail Yeah, I mean, went. It's, it's a potential there. And as long as you understand that there's no more money sure. coming from Bristol, we'll, you know, joint resolutions don't cost anything. You know, I, I like you, to under-promise and over-deliver, but to stand here and swear that we've never come back for another resolution to support yeah. a multi-jurisdictional <laughs> grant that would enhance the trail and therefore enhance Bristol's economic <laughs> impact from it, that's a little hard to promise, but we're not going to come back, we're not going to come here ever and ask the city of Bristol for money. I promised that two years ago, and we've yeah. not asked for any money. And won't. I, I move to go ahead and support this application. All right, we got a motion, Mr. Hartley, to support it. That's Mr. Hubbard. I'm sorry, Mr. Hubbard. I'll you second. get Kyle Hartley from after tonight. I got to get one last gig in yes. before you're out. <laughs> I'll second. All right, Mr. Hartley has seconded it. Any more council discussion? All right, please call the roll. Hartley. Yes. Hubbard. Yes. Lingard. Yes. Abstain. Thank you. And I will say I abstain because I do have property out in the Mendota Venoms area that I own, so I didn't want to vote on something that potentially would have an impact one way or another, so that's why I abstain, just so everybody knows. All right, we're on to item, um, I think that was the last of the normal agenda items, on to the consent agenda. Uh, what's the pleasure of council on the? Move to adopt the consent agenda as presented. I got a motion, Mr. Hartley, to approve as presented. Second. Second, Mr. Hubbard. Please call the roll. Hartley. Yes. Hubbard. Yes. 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 
All right, matters to be presented by members of the public, not agenda. We got one person signed up, Ginger Fleener. It says other Ginger Fleener. Non agenda. Well, she was the first one. She's above you. Oh, I'm sorry. There's two. Yeah. Miss Fleener signed up and then you. My name is Ginger Fleener. I live at 239 Sherwood Road. Um, I'm going to make this as short and sweet as possible. From the time I began coming to these meetings, it was my belief and my understanding that you come to these things to voice your opinion and your concern. The last meeting that I came to and did that with um, my comment had made it to the newspaper. Whatever. I, I didn't even know about it, ironically, until my neighbor was driving down the road and started discussing this with me. Okay, fine. Well, I noticed after that that the newspaper had decided to put a poll on there. Ironically, there were some people that had made some comments underneath that poll. Okay, fine. Well, when the last meeting of the video came out, I sat down and I watched it. I get this world is not perfect. And I completely understand that people are going to talk and say things about other people. However, growing up, I, I, I let people do that to me. I let them make fun of me. I let them call me names to the point where I got severely depressed. So bad that I would cut myself. Until one day I realized I've got a voice. I'm my own individual person. And you know, I promised myself to that day I didn't want to be like everybody else. So really my main point of coming here is to clarify a couple of things. Unfortunately, one member had left. By no means am I a liberal, by no means do I follow any organization nor group. I don't follow people. I do my own thing because I want to be different. I want to set the right example for my kids. Be your own individual person and be proud of who you are. My life experiences, I'm very proud of who I am. The only thing I ask is next time that someone would like to say something of a comment that I've said, I've stated my address. More than welcome to come to my door and talk to me about it. Be a person, have a heart, show respect for other people. Okay, thank you. All right, Miss Marnie. Nancy Marney, uh, I'm a resident of the city of Bristol, Virginia. I'm a taxpayer, I own property. Out of the June 20th newspaper, I have brought a classified notice about the um, Ingenco Wholesale Power Company. Folks, this place has been classified officially as a major source of air pollution. I didn't know that until I read this in the paper. I brought it with me. You're welcome to it. Now, in the article in today's paper, it was noted that there had been, in essence, there had been no complaints, no uh, contacts, no nothing from anyone concerning this plant. Well, yes, there have, from me. And in the last three years or so, I contacted the former city manager at least twice, and I think three times. 
I talked with Mr. Hubbard two or three weeks ago, and I've talked with other people about the god-awful smell that was coming from the dump. The kind that makes your head want to explode and your eyes run and your nose fills up and you can't breathe. Now, I have free access to an expert allergist. And I can support everything I'm saying. It would cost the city probably $1,000 to get the same opinion I can get free. I think the city of Bristol, Virginia, and I'm, I'm racing this stupid clock here, I think the city of Bristol, Virginia should do whatever is in this article right here to complain to the Air Pollution Board and not issue this company a permit. We already have air pollution from the interstate highway system. Come sit on my front porch, share the smell. We have it from the racetrack. Come sit on my front porch, share the smell. It's just lovely. We even got it from Kingsport one time, from the paper place down there. Uh, the smell gets in your house and it permeates everything. It's no fun, folks. I think this city council should take this, do whatever this thing says, and stop it. Close that place up, get rid of them. If we are in such bad shape, we have to have businesses like this, the state deserves to take us over. Now, before this red light comes on, I would, would bring this point forth. The vultures are already circling this carcass. The vultures are already circling. Remember, gentlemen, the devil is in the detail. Be very, very careful. Stay the course. The vultures are already circling. I leave this here for anybody who wants it. I don't. Thank you. All right, with that said, um, City Council is now adjourned.